there's lots going on here at Golden Square um, and further afield, uh, Route 6 in Scotland. Um, I'm at, and, and Kevin's at as well, on, on Thursday. I, I doubt you'll be able to take the day off work and fly up to Glasgow and join us at the, uh, at the Jigsaw 24 office in, um, in Glasgow. But uh, that, that's a big HDR event because obviously that's, the, uh, that's what all the cool kids want at the moment. Um, uh, but as we always say, the tech breakfasts are about... Um, engineering fundamentals, uh, and, and that's early in the morning with uh, coffee and croissant. And then later in the day here at uh, Golden Square, um, we do all the sort of product-related demos and training and that kind of thing. So, so the, uh, the next one coming up on the 20th is, is Test Drive in S6 um, uh, with my colleagues from the audio uh, side of the business. Um, and uh, there's always something, you know, on a week-by-week -week basis going on either here at Golden Square or at one of the other Jigsaw 24 offices. So keep an eye on uh, jigsaw24.com uh, for all that information. But today, uh, uh, tech breakfast, uh, developments in SDI cabling, cabling for 12G. Uh, obviously, unless you've lived under the ro uh, a rock for the last five years, uh, you, you, you can't fail to be aware that 4K UHD, and I'll use the two terms interchangeably even though I'm, I'm aware that they're not strictly speaking the same thing, um, uh, 12G cabling is, is starting to become a thing. Um, uh, you know, obviously for the first sort of four years of, of 4K working, we've been doing quad um, uh, 3G or quad 1.5G or some terrible manufacturer 6G standard. Uh, but 12G is the SMPTE certified standard. And in fact, SMPTE are also talking about um, 24G. And in fact, Kevin sent me a, an article last night uh, 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 a discussion paper from Simpty about 100G for video, and you think, it's, it's, it's madness, where's it all going, you know? Um, but uh, we'll, we'll start off by talking about a little bit of a history of, of digital video transport uh, and, and how that led to SDI, um, uh, some of the, the variations and adaptions that SDI has been used for. SDI isn't just used for synchronous um, baseband video. Uh, uh, and then we get into the meat of this morning, that's the physical layer considerations, because as, as engineers building facilities, that's the thing we worry about. You know, will, will we find that when we've run a cable from the machine room to the edit suite, is it even usable um, at these data rates? Um, uh, and, and, and we'll have a look at the kind of displays that help us in, in making those um, uh, decisions and, and those analyses. Uh, the eye pattern, which is, the, is used you know, throughout the, all of, of, sort of digital engineering. Um, uh, you know, people who are analysing uh, Ethernet and, and other um, you know, AES, other signal standards, are very familiar with eye patterns. Um, and, and some of the options uh, for, for you know, when, when copper cabling doesn't do it for us, you know, fibre optics, essentially. Um, and, uh, and, and 12G, uh, we've recently done a, um, a bit of a, a, a shootout between different grades of, of cable that comes from the manufacturer claiming to be 12G capable. There's a couple of samples I've got here of, of some of the cables we were testing yesterday and we've got a full set of test results which we'll put online and I'll allude to here with some graphs and stuff as to how those different kinds of cable uh, deal with, with 12G working. But um, uh, SDI um, is standardised by Simpty. Um, uh, you know, and starting you know, back way away when I started my career in the 80s, uh, REC 601, REC 656, which is the electrical standard for um, uh, transmitting uh, broadcast video. And, uh, and we get all the way up to um, uh, uh, you know, SMPTE 292, which is, you know, talks about uh, 1.5 gigabit uh, S, um, HD video, which is the standard we probably to this day still use the most. Um, uh, and uh, 2083 specifies a maximum of 24 gigabits if you want to be able to get up to 120 frames per second at a 4K raster. Uh, and that's limited to YCBCR, so 422 working. Um, uh, if you want RGB at high frame rates at a big raster, then, then you need to go even further. And as I say, Simpty and I are talking about a 100 gigabit interface, uh, you know, to be the, the video interface to end all video interfaces. Um, uh, but essentially, these all sort of define uh, colour spaces, rasters, frame rates, those kind of things, and, and, and they really don't talk about uh, the physical layer. Now, engineers of a certain age, and I don't know if any of you will remember this, but, but you know, back in the early 90s, you know, kind of uh, the you know, workshops of Soho were full of these little gadgets, serialisers and deserialisers, because our very first digital video standard was a, a parallel standard. It was, it was REC 656, SMPTE standard, came out the back of, of, of VTRs and such, Silicon Graphics workstations, those kind of things, on a 25 pin connector, you know, would go just a few meters, and you know, just made wiring uh, facilities hard. And so, and so, very quickly, these kind of gadgets showed up, which would convert the, the parallel 25 pin D standard to um, uh, BNCs. And although there was a uh, 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 both SMPTE e EBU combined standard for um, uh, serialized digital video. It was actually the Sony standard, SDI, that won out and kind of essentially Sony gave it to the industry. 
and then kind of SMPTE retroactively kind of certified it and said, yes, 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 this is a SMPTE standard now, jolly good. Uh, and there's the sort of the family of standards as they've progressed. Um, you know, the kind of thing that, 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 that uh, you know, typified by sort of DigiBeta and D1, uh, you know, running all the way through the kind of things that was typified by HDCAM and, and uh, HDCAM SR and, and all the way to the standards we're talking about today. You know, this is what we're going to be talking about, SMPTE um, 2082. Uh, which is you know, embodied electrically, at least, on the physical layer uh, as 12G uh, SDI. Um, a, bit of a bit of a summary there. Uh, one or more coaxial cables with BNC connectors. And, and the reason we say one or more is because dual link was a thing for a long, long time, uh, with, particularly with film facilities who needed to move uh, RGB-A, you know, so RGB and, a, and an alpha channel, a key, uh, uh, on videotape or, or around their facilities. A normal impedance of 75 ohms, and we'll talk a little bit about what that means, kind of thing. That's a bit, 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 of, a, bit of a strange thing. Why do, why do we define cables in terms of impedances? You know, surely the longer the cable, the more the impedance, but no. Um, uh, signal amplitude in, in, in the sort of 800 millivolts range, so very akin to analog video, you know, and, and that was obviously chosen, you know, BNCs, that, you know, the 75 ohm lines, 800 millivolts of signal, very, very uh, akin to uh, you know, an eye on reusing the old analog infrastructures. Um, Uncompressed digital component signals encoded in the NRZI, non-return to zero, oh, I forget what the I stands for, format. Inverted. 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 So, so essentially self-clocking um, uh, digital bit streams. You don't need a separate video word clock to go along with, with, with the video bit stream. Um, and and uh, uh, you know, shift registers used to scramble the data to remove DC offsets before they get put onto the line. Uh, you know, self-synchronizing, self-clocking, you know, um, uh, you don't need anything other than the incoming signal to be able to see where the, the bits start and stop and clock edges are, etc. Um, and, uh, you, you know, sort of framing sequences um, uh, which rely on predictable um, bit patterns to say, here's the start of an SDR frame, here's the end of an SDR frame. Very sort of standard if you're familiar with AES or, or how um, uh, Ethernet works. Um, and, 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 and uh, you know, the SDI kind of expanded and was used for lots of things. Dual link SDI, as we've already alluded to, for 24P4444. Um, ASI, the format used for um, Eric. Splendid to see you. I was going to make a joke earlier at your expense. I was going to say, engineers of a certain age remember these boxes very well. <laughs> um, uh, and... and um, I got ahead of myself there. Uh, uh, ASI, very familiar to people who work in transmission uh, and those kind of things. So, so um, SDI that's been encoded up into, uh, into part of an MPEG transport stream, ready to go off to multiplexes and stuff for, 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 for use in transmission. SDTI, um, uh, you know, again, a development on SDI, which allowed, um, uh, again, non-baseband, so compressed DV or MPEG, uh, video streams to be moved faster than real time. You could, you could do a, an HDCAM, HDCAM deck dub at, 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 at twice normal speed using SDTI. In fact, I think that went back, almost, that, that went back as far as D2. I think some D2 machines had SDTI as well. Um, and, 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 and obviously, as, as data rates have gone up and effective cable lengths have come down, uh, we have to rely on optical cabling. And so again, there's a SMPTE standard 297-2006 uh, for, for transmitting SDI over fiber. Um, you know, so it seems it's been a remarkably expandable, remarkably accommodating standard uh, you know, for the industry. So with all that in mind, let's talk a little bit about physical layer considerations, um, uh, fundamental electrical uh, parameters. So if you think about a piece of coaxial cable, um, you know, which is obviously a, a center conductor, and then a dielectric that's wrapped around that, made of some foamy material, some plasticky material, and then a, uh, a woven metal um, uh, sort of covering that goes across that, that's the, the, the screen, the ground, and then a, a, a low smoke zero halogen jacket that goes across the top of that, that's the typical construction of a, of a coaxial cable, and you think, jolly good, I've got two conductors and that's it, well no you haven't, uh, anything other than sort of like low frequency DC type response, you've got uh, a little circuit that looks a bit like that, so the, 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 the conducting um, uh, centre of the cable has got a per metre impedance, they're shown as R, RDX, and it's got a per meter inductance as well. Um, and then there's uh, an impedance between the conductor and the, uh, and the braided shield uh, by virtue of the fact that, you know, we're talking about high frequencies here. And there's, of course, a capacitance. You, 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 know, you look at the, 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 the conductor to the braided shield uh, uh, with, with, with a, uh, an insulating material in between. And that's the very definition of a capacitor, isn't it? So in a sense, you've got, you've got this little circuit repeated thousands of times down the length of the cable 
producing a, a, a characteristic um, uh, impedance, capacitance, kind of inductance, kind of mix all the way down the cable. And, and that's what gives rise to this idea of a, of a cable that has a characteristic impedance. We say it's a, it's, it's a 75 ohm cable. And, and there's a you know, little, little equation there, Nick from Wikipedia. Um, uh, you, you know, if you, if you take the, the, you know, the per meter shunt capacitance, uh, the per meter impedance, and, 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 and the, um, the conductance per length of the dielectric, and, and all those things, then you can work out um, the physical characteristics of the cable. And so for SDI, we are straining to have a consistent uh, 75 ohm characteristic impedance along the length of this cable, be it a little one meter cable that's going between two pieces of equipment in the same rack, or whether it's going between the equipment in the machine room and the edit suite, or, or whatever the configuration. Um, uh, some of the things that are worth pointing out is, is, is that the, what makes the big difference in the quality of, of high frequency cables is the quality of the dielectric. And I was chatting to a guy from Conductville, who's a big Spanish manufacturer, who manufacture for Belden in Europe. And he said that the thing that Belden really cracked in the late 90s was this idea of nitrogen inflation. So as the, as the cable gets extruded from the machine that, that, that makes the cable, so, so the, the outer braid is being woven as it gets extruded, and, and, and the center core is being extruded you know, as, as molten copper and then cooled and pulled out as a wire, and, and then the, the, um, the dielectric's being covered onto it. Uh, if, you, if you use pressurized nitrogen to inflate that dielectric so that it fills the space much better, you get a much better characteristic um, uh, uh, shunt capacitance per meter for the cable, and as a consequence, you get a cable that's much more responsive. Um, uh, uh, you know, it behaves much better from a, a high-frequency digital point of view. And uh, Belden, um, uh, you know, protected that process, and the, their manufacturers uh, would use it. But when you compare the performance of Belden 1694 or one of those kinds of cables with what's seemingly a very similar cable uh, like Image 1000, which is now a trade name owned by Argosy, uh, there's quite a marked difference in performance of those cables, and it's entirely down to nitrogen inflation. That's the, that's the shtick. So once you've launched the di digital signal down a cable, uh, what are the things that, that degrade uh, that signal and how far it will go and how, how easy the, the equipment at the other end can recover the data stream? Uh, well, essentially, uh, there's the eye pattern. There's the, there's the thing that, 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 uh, that we, we'd like to measure. And the eye pattern is, is the result of the bit stream being overlaid on top of, on, on top of itself many, many, many times. So, so a persistence of vision effect within the measuring equipment, within the, 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 the scope that's looking at the, at the signal. So you can see all the ones and all the zeros overlaid on top of each other. And that gives you a very nice representation of the health of the signal. You know, if you remember your textbooks, if you did... You know, computing at school or university, you'll remember that digital signals in textbooks are always represented by very hard-edged stepped waveforms, aren't they? You know, that's a one, that's a zero, and it's digital in it, you know, and, 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 and that's why, uh, you know, quality is maintained over hundreds of generations, because it's digital. Um, but actually, there's no such thing as digital signals travelling down a cable. It's digital information you're imposing on an analogue cable, and all the same degradations that that signal will suffer going down the cable apply. So, so essentially, we look on a, uh, you know, we look at in, a, in our manual for our for our physical layer uh, scope, uh, and it shows us that this sort of eye pattern here. And look, there's here's, here are some specs, you know, point point eight of a volt, you know, um, uh, peak to peak, because that's you know that's a one and that's a zero, and and then jitter. We don't want the 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 timing edges to become too smeared, which is what happens differential timing problems as 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 the as the signal travels down the cable, and and also the rise time. Of, of, of the ones and the zeros. We don't want that to be degraded too much because um, you know, therein lies the ability of the equipment at the other end to detect what's a one and what's a zero, the rising and the falling edges. Uh, and um, you know, that, that's, that's a very nice summary of, of, of what we want of our, of our digital signal. Um, and in fact, there's a screen grab from my trusty Tektronics, I do apologise, Kevin. Um, we're getting to leader to it at the end. Um, uh, and, and, and there you can see the various things that the, 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 the analyzer has measured. Um, uh, eye amplitude, um, rise time, fall time. You kind of think that rise times and fall times will always be the same, because you know, the same physical effects that affect rise times should affect fall times as well, generally speaking, they are. So, so on this signal particularly, we have an 80 picosecond. Picoseconds, I mean, you know. Um, uh, uh, and, and lots of other things being measured there. Uh, jitter, 56 picoseconds of jitter on the cable. And so, and so this is a very short cable um, uh, uh, you know, between the output of the test signal generator and the back of the, uh, the scope. Now, 
that's under ideal conditions. This is, this is um, 100 metres of, of high quality coax and it's Bell N1694. Um, this is typical damage that it does to the picture. And, and so here's my quad display and you see the picture and some other things that are being measured. Uh, there's you know, just a few metres of cable and it's not quite looking as tidy as the diagrams suggest it should do, but hey, this is, this is as good as it gets. And then that's at the end of 100 metres. And you can see that all the things that are measurable, jitter, uh, and cable loss, attenuation, are terrible, but for some reason, <laughs> we can still recover a picture. Now, this is just a still image, and no doubt, um, uh, uh, you know, with, with an eye pattern so degraded as that, uh, you know, if you spend any time watching that, you'll be seeing corrupted frames, you'll be seeing sparklies and, and you know, loss of lock and all the kind of things that make that unusable. Uh, but uh, suffice to say, most modern equipment can do, a, can do a marvelous job recovering what looks like a really, really terrible signal, you know, an almost unrecognizable eye pattern. It might just be noise, but it's still at least managed to recover that one frame that we're looking at now. So it's not just all about um, the quality of the cable. The other thing that bedevils us um, in, in television is, uh, any, anybody who wants to move SDI uh, video, is return loss. Uh, uh, return loss is, is, is when uh, the receiving piece of equipment doesn't perfectly terminate the line uh, and in fact reflects some of the signal back up the line, which then gives you um, a, uh, 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 the effect of, of attenuating the incoming signal. It, it interferes with the incoming signal. Uh, and uh, you know, there's a whole lot of standards for this, um, but typically what we'd like to see at 3G is no worse than 16 dBs of, of, of return loss on a BNC input to a piece of equipment. Um, you know, Sony and Tektronix and all the other um, uh, your quality manufacturers always do better. I've measured 12 dBs, which is terrible on, on, on low-end equipment, Blackmagic and the like. And when you take their equipment apart, it's no surprise. You, you know, uh, you look at the quality of the BNC and how it attaches to the board and such. Sometimes it's a right angle BNC and you think just that, that sort of right angle curve at 3G, how on earth? But um, yeah, return loss is the other thing to consider. And whereas you might have a, a, a run that's perfectly acceptable uh, because it's a piece of Tektronics equipment sending and it's a piece of Sony equipment or a piece of leader equipment at the other end receiving, when you put a more budget piece of equipment in the way, it introduces return loss into the, into the circuit and, and all of a sudden you're getting either corruption or no signal whatsoever. And I'm reminded of a, an incident up at ITV in Manchester where, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the Orange Tower where ITV's facility is in Manchester, but one side of the, of the building where all the edit suites are and, and the dubbing rooms is very close to the machine room. The other side of the building is quite a distance. The cable runs are all greater than 100 metres, all the edit suites down the other side of the building. And, and so we ran all those edit suites in fibre and all the signage displays that are up on columns around the common areas and things like that, all run in fibre, and then we convert at the back of the, at the, back of the telly. And ITV free issued us with some real budget um, fibre, uh, no, some real budget um, SDI to HDMI adapters. Um, and we discovered that although our Tektronics on the output of the fibre converter was showing a fantastic signal, almost no loss at all, by the time we put it through this budget converter into the telly, couldn't see anything and we assumed that these budget converters were, were, were bad but actually the return loss on the input of the budget converters was so great that the little one meter cable that my wiring guide made up to go between the two converters on the back of the telly uh, there was so much return loss that one meter cable just wasn't enough to dissipate it and so when we put a three meter cable in its place all of a sudden we got nice pictures so return loss is a complicated business and sometimes makes things happen that we don't really you know that, that seem counterintuitive so a few years ago, we did uh, some cable testing for 3G cable types. Um, you know, when 3G was a thing uh, in the late noughties, um, uh, I think we did, did all this in 2009, 2010. Um, and, uh, and you see the, 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 the grades of cable used across the top there, Belden 1694, the favourite, um, Conduct Fill, which is a European manufactured Belden equivalent. In fact, they also badge their cable for Belden. Uh, Draca. Um, another big one, uh, Belden 1855, which is a skinny coax, conduct fill equivalent, and DRACA um, uh, equivalent at the end there. So the DRACA ones are now owned by Argosy, and they're sold as Image 1000 and Image 360. Um, and so looking at lengths against KI diagrams, no surprise, you can see that as you go down the lengths, the eye diagram becomes degraded. And if you look really closely, you can see the Tektronix's measurement of jitter and attenuation is getting bad down here, it really is. So, this kind of provoked us to make the decision that whenever we were doing a 3G install, 
At 60 metres, we'd say to the customer, look, we really need to be doing this over fibre. 60 metres, I mean, actually probably less than 60 metres. I'm seeing red indications here um, on these high quality cable types. So 50 metres or below, we'd really like to do it over fibre, please. But in fact, you can go all the way up to 160 metres, you know, um, and we're still recovering a picture. Um, but, but, you know, the parameters are all terrible and the eye diagrams look terrible. Uh, so just because you can see pictures today doesn't mean uh, this is a good way to be progressing. So after our formalised testing of 3G cable types, we came to some conclusions. So the 60 metres was the workable length under optimal conditions for you know, good quality cable, good quality equipment. Um, SDI coax, so skinny coax, goes about half the distance, which seems counterintuitive because going from 270 megabits per second to 1.5 or 3 gigabits per second is several octaves. So you'd expect it to go a quarter of the distance maybe. You know, it's, it's a bandwidth distance product, isn't it? You, know, you, you double the distance um, you'd expect it to only be able to carry half, you know, an octave less, half the data rate, half the bandwidth required. Uh, but that's probably more down to the fact that equipment's very good at error correction and concealment and, and auto attenuation. Um, the variation between the very best and the very worst cables that we tested was, you know, at usable distances, no more than 10 metres. You know, 50 metres, 60 metres, 10 metres was kind of the limit. Um, uh, and, and, and sort of observations that we've made already. Um, but the main event, the thing you really came to listen to today, uh, the results of our 12G physical layer testing, uh, which we've been doing with our, with our demo LV5490, which is leaders' um, uh, 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 4K UHD uh, test set. Um, uh, and uh, you know, if you've been to any events recently about HDR or, or 4K here at Jigsaw, you'll have seen us demoing and using the leader. Um, I've been a Tektronix guy for 30 years, and, and you know, until six months ago, I would have sworn that the answer to every question about waveform monitoring was Tektronix. Um, but uh, very familiar with the 8000 series, 8200, 8300, but uh, they've kind of stalled in terms of HDR and 4K UHD monitoring, and LIDAR is kind of leading the way in this respect. Leading the way. Um, they, they have um, uh, fantastic displays for HDR, which colorists just kind of you know, open their eyes at and it really is a very helpful tool to have in a grading room. So, you know, if you need demos of, of the leader, um, you know, uh, ask me, ask Kevin, um, uh, and we can come around and show you all the different kind of HDR content, uh, you know, PQ, uh, PQ, um, Dolby PQ, or, or HLG, or Sony S-Log, or whatever, whatever your format you're worried about, the leader's kind of got you covered. Um, it also allows us to do 12G physical layer testing. Internal to the machine is a 12G test signal generator, and also it can do 12G eye diagrams, 12G physical layer measurements. So before we start launching into test results and, and all that kind of stuff, let's just remind ourselves of SIMPTE 2082-1, which you know, you're probably all very familiar with the, these numbers. These should be kind of uh, you know, embedded in your memory. But these are um, the amplitude, uh, rise time, fall time, um, jitter figures that we work to you know, for 12G. And uh, then when you start looking at um, uh, 12GI patterns, so this is a piece of high quality coax, um, two meters long at 1.5G. Lovely, square edges, lovely. This is the same uh, uh, piece of cable at 12G. Uh, and so two meters and, and, and kind of, this is our starting point. This is the best it gets. You know, this is not looking like a lovely sharp square wave already. So 12G clearly from the, from the off, from, from the start is a, is a challenge. So having taken four different cable types um, uh, and, and, and testing them at numerous lengths at 12G, this is kind of the best and the worst. So, so SD73, which is an equivalent to Belden 7731, it's, it's, it's the factory uh, pre-branded version of 7731. And then comparing that to Belden um, 1855, uh, which is what you all know is Image 360, and there's two samples of that there. So, I mean, just look and see what a blinking hose pipe that is. That's even sturdier and thicker and harder to dress into a rack than, um, than Belden 1694 is. Um, and, and then this is the, this is the stuff you, you know and love already. That's an SD, SD01, otherwise known as Image 360. So. Here we've got um, uh, the length of the cable and uh, uh, all the, all the um, 2082 uh, parameters. 
And so this is the very best quality cable. And before our signal becomes unusable from, a, from an attenuation point of view, we've got somewhere between 10 and 15 metres of cable. Well, that's kind of horrific, isn't it? And even jitter figures are starting to get untenable at 10 metres. For the skinny coax, uh, there's a 5 metre length, and our, our attenuation is still good, but the jitter figures are starting to creep up. And by 10 metres, uh, the jitter's so bad the machine couldn't even measure it and the attenuation is, is below spec. So, I mean, this tells us some terrible, terrible things about 12G cabling. It's kind of almost impossible, you know. But if you think about it, going back to our 3G tests, we said 50 meters was about the best we could do with high quality coax, uh, and that's at 3G. So 12G is two octaves above 3G, so it's a bandwidth distance product. Uh, so at 12G, we should be expecting Half of, half of 50 is 25, half of 25 is about 12 metres, is about 12 metres, somewhere between there and there. So, in a sense, nobody should be horrified that 12G just doesn't go very far down copper, copper coaxial cable. Uh, you, you know, if it didn't, you know, sort of five years ago when we were testing for 3G, it, 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 you know, nothing's changed, there's no magic going on in cable manufacture. It may be the case that manufacturers have got some other tricks to make coaxial cable better at carrying high frequency signals, but at the moment, it seems that with the best quality coax you can use for 12G, you shouldn't really plan on doing much more than about 10 or 15 meters um, uh, runs, which be kind of comes untenable really, I think, you know, if you're trying to build a facility. Um, here's, uh, uh, again, another screen grab from, my, from, from, the, um, from the leader, and uh, this is 36 meters of the skinny coax of Image360. And at this point, we've just hit the, hit the point where uh, the eye diagram is clearly rubbish. You know, it's just noise. Uh, can't even measure any of the rise time information that we need. Uh, but it's still doing a jolly good job of trying to recover the signals. And clearly, this is, this is a corrupt frame. And I spent an age doing a frame grab, a frame grab, frame grab, trying to get a corrupt frame. And so I thought it'd be quite entertaining to see what that looks like as a video. So uh, just, you know, see how on the hairy edge, 36 metres of of skinny coaxes for a 12G signal. It's kind of only just kind of holding on, isn't it? Um, and and this, is why, this is why we have standards. This is why uh, you don't want to be relying on, yes, my picture's being recovered. This is why you want to rely on, yes, my picture's being recovered, and I'm comfortable with the, the physical layer performance of this piece of cable. Now, there's the, the four cable types that we tested, all of which come from the manufacturer as being 12G compliant. Um, and, and, and this is the amplitude versus cable length. And so there at the very top is, is SD73, otherwise known as Belden 7733, 77, um, and there's uh, Belden 6094, 1855, and um, SDF5, which is an equi I can't remember the equivalent number for Belden. But um, uh, you know, there's, this is our amp amplitude here and distance along the bottom here, these very modest distances along the bottom here. And you can see that at 640, um, uh, uh, 640 millivolts, which is really amplitude is what governs everything. If the amplitude is right, generally speaking, the jitter figures are right, you know, for a piece of cable. Um, you know, we are around about five meters maximum, you know, it's, it's, it's not very pretty. It's not, it's not a useful um, technology, as it were. So you, you think to yourself, ah, but maybe the BNC's got something to do with it. Maybe those lovely gold BNC's that all the manufacturers will sell me as being 12G BNCs, maybe they are what redeems this whole situation and means we can get decent lengths. Well, we did all our testing with the gold uh, 12G BNCs, and then we repeated some of them with, with just regular 3G BNCs, and it makes scant difference, you know, modest difference at best, you know, nothing that we wouldn't give you more than a couple of inches of extra length in the cable. So, not quite audiophile, gold-plated mains plug territory, but nearly, you know, nearly as pointless as the kind of rubbish that, that, um, that uh, hi-fi magazines will sell you. Um, so what's the answer? Well, the answer is, I think, you know, fibre. And um, we're starting to get products now. Barnfind, our favourite uh, fibre part manufacturer, you know, multiplexer switching uh, product, uh, they're starting to bring, uh, bring up a 12G product now. And so they, they, they've got barn minis that work at 12G. They're about to relaunch their, their routing switcher that's, as a 12G fibre uh, switcher, which will work nicely for all of this. Uh, and um, 
you know, so, so hopefully uh, the end is in sight, um, you know, and we'll be able to sort of, uh, you know, breathe a sigh of relief and, and, and go back to uh, sitting in the workshop undisturbed. Um, so a bit of further reading before we take any questions. Um, Textronics have a great uh, document about, about physical layer measurements. Um, Digital Signal Processing, which is a, a great general uh, book about, um, about, uh, about clocking and, and, and yeah, receiving and all that kind of stuff. Um, and I've discovered it's, it's, it's available online. The fact that <laughs> I found it on a web server that doesn't even have a domain name probably means it's not strictly legal, but there you go. Um, you, I, I was able to download it yesterday, so maybe it's still online today. Um, uh, the Art of Digital Video by John Watkinson is, is, is a book that all engineers should have. They, they, they give it out free at Ravensbourne, I hope. Um, I, I thought I'd put up the, the, cop, the, the, the cover of the third edition, which is the most recent one I've had, because the fourth edition has got a terrible cover. Um, it's much, much nicer to look at, the third edition. And then there's, there's numerous articles on both the Route 6 and my own blog about all this rubbish, all this nonsense. Um, so uh, thank you very much. And, and if you want to ask anything now about these tests that we've been running on, on 12G, uh, now's a good time and we can, we can spin back to so, some of those results and sort of have them up on screen so that they're, uh, they're sort of in our mind. But otherwise, uh, those croissants won't eat themselves and you're welcome to save some more coffee or if you need to scoot off because your sand has fallen over, then uh, feel free as well. <laughs>